Hi, this is Bill Kennedy with the Arden Labs podcast, and our special guest today is Michael Gash, all the way from Germany. What, what city are you in? Hey, in Bill. Good to be on the show. Thank you. So I'm based out of Leipzig, which is, uh, I mean, you're like almost German pro. It's in the east, uh, like Middle East, not the Middle East, but the Middle East of Germany. And it's an hour by train to Berlin. Hour by train. All right, now I got a good sense. That's nice. I, I cannot wait to be able to get back to Germany and Berlin. Ugh. I know. We are here to kind of learn your story um, through through kind of your career in tech. But before we start that, why don't you give everybody uh, the two minute um, kind of pitch on where you are right now and, and what you're doing. Sure, that makes sense. Um, so again, I'm Michael, I'm a staff engineer at, working at VMware and I'm working in the office of the CTO at VMware. Uh, previously I had a couple of roles there, but right now I'm in the office of the CTO and this is where we prototype and innovate on, um, I would say, some like leading, bleeding edge technology. And right now, like these days, um, I'm mostly on the service mesh space on one hand. And just to drop names, Kubernetes Istio would fall into that category. And on eventing and like serverless platforms on the other hand, which would be Knative, for example. And, and the end goal of the work you're doing is to... I have to imagine, try to improve and or abstract these compute, complex compute environments. So somebody like me could just build something, drop it somewhere, and it just runs and scales. Obviously, I don't need a little bit, but is that the sure. idea? Yeah, absolutely. Make it boring for people to write code, basically. Oh, love boring. Yes. I, I'm also curious, because I'm starting to see a lot of commercials in the States now about hybrid cloud this idea where you're going to run a, a a local data center in conjunction with your cloud data center right and everybody moved so quickly out of their own data centers uh to take advantage of the cloud but do you see people you see that coming back do you see people setting up their own data centers even in their own offices is this what yeah. we're, we're looking at um yes so part of the service mesh work that we are doing we are basically not strictly looking at you're doing this on-prem or you're doing this in the cloud. In fact, we are thinking more like a fabric uh, around the globe, if you will. And so it doesn't really matter where you are and where you program. Um, you could call it hybrid or you could call it agnostic, depending on how you, how you look at these things. Yeah, so our CTO, Greg Lavender, who came to VMware two years ago um, from Citibank, they basically went through the same transition as your question was in terms of from on-prem to the cloud, Obviously not fully because Citibank is a huge organization, but they realized that um, certain things are easier in the cloud, like access to machine learning and these kind of tools, like and, and bursting. But then on the other hand, because of the data volume and the gravity where this kind of data resides and where they needed it, like on-prem, um, it was just too expensive um, in some areas to go back and forth. So we see actually these kind of different workloads coming back uh, to on-prem and in certain extent, like Kubernetes has also made it easier for people to migrate or shift workloads because the, the this abstraction basically of bringing your workload anywhere with the standardized API kind of makes this possible or at least easier. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, brilliant. We're going to get back to some of that, but I want to I want to yes. learn a little bit more about you and your kind of journey through tech to where where you end up here at um, VMware. So. Um, I want you to kind of go back in time and if you can remember at least kind of your age or your year, that really helps everybody get a sense of what the world was like back at that moment. Um, what are some of your first memories working, working with a computer? You know, I grew up in East Germany. Let's start there. So I grew up in East Germany and I was seven years old. I just came to school. Um, elementary school. I just came to school and three months later the wall came down. So that was 89, 1989. Just to put things into perspective. So imagine you, you go to school in like a completely different system because like uh, this was kind of communism, social communism, where they were pretty strong on building an identity around the whole social idea and so you were in these kind of 
I don't know the word, the English word for the kind of clubs or organizations. And I wouldn't say I was indoctrinated because I was just too young by the time, but you knew that was kind of the path, right? And also this is like totally like no value objections here. Like this was just the system by the time. But then, you know, things happened three months later, the wall came down. And so the whole system changed for a lot of people. And I was young, um, so I don't really remember a lot. But what I do remember is that my parents and a lot of their friends lost their jobs. So all of a sudden, right, because the whole economy collapsed, if you will, a lot of them lost their jobs. And so they had to adapt to this new uh, Western kind of industry style and uh, the new basically democracy that we had. That meant that my father, my dad, had to also look for a new job. And so he went on uh, and found a job in Munich. So he basically went back and forth. So Munich is like, today it's four hours. Like but let, me, let me interrupt yeah. you. You were living in Berlin at the time that happened, or this affected the entire country, not just Berlin? C country, yeah. I was close to Berlin. With like, I, I wasn't even in Leipzig by the time. I was like in a small, small, very small village, right? But because we were part of, part of the East Germany, like we were East Germany, which was called like um, the German Democratic Republic, GDR, uh, that whole uh, country basically collapsed. And with it, the, the whole industry. So people lost their jobs. Wow. Yeah, so it's, it's like everybody's excited about it, but then there's yes. this kind yeah. of short-term aftermath yes. of yes. you shouldn't be too happy because guess what just happened? Exactly. The, the economy yeah. falls apart. Wow. Yeah. So now people are both happy and I guess a little scared and nervous. Like who knows what's going to happen, right? Exactly. Because, you know, these people were all, when I say these people, like my parents, um, especially this generation, like my parents, who grew up mostly during that time of Cold War and living in, the, in, in communism, all of a sudden for them, everything changed. Yes, they had freedom now. Like we, that, that was the whole hope of this revolution, right? This is how this kicked off. And in fact, it kicked off in the city I'm living right now in Leipzig, where these kind of protest march, marches started against the, uh, the government. So that was this hope, exactly as you said. And then the wall came down, everyone was excited. But now, because everything also collapsed industry-wise, like the economy in that part, people were out of business, basically, and they didn't have jobs. And they also had to adopt to like a whole new industry and how things are like basically done uh, in a completely different economy, because like the Western economy. And um, so that was that was tough for a lot of people. And you still like if you talk to some older people here um, in the East, you a lot of them are still like, yeah, it was better in these old days, good old days. Mm. But on the other hand, these the generations after, especially like my kids who don't even know what GDR is and like a wall, right? You can't even imagine what there's a wall. Well, maybe you guys can, but uh, we can't anymore. Um, so that was different for, for the people. And so my, my dad, he was lucky because he could, he could adapt. Uh, he was an engineer. And so he found a job in Munich, which kind of was like six, six hours uh, between from where we lived and then where he had to go every week. So he was out every week, came back on a weekend. But so then, you didn't move. You didn't move. He yes, didn't think about yes. moving. He thought... Yeah, exactly. Wow. That's, that's actually the model. Usually people are like these, these commuters and then on the weekend they come home. And that was very popular, quote, quote, popular by the time, even in like the early 2000s here where a lot of people from the East uh, were commuting, quote, quote, commuting under the week to like somewhere in West Germany or even Switzerland, Austria, wherever the jobs are. And then on the weekend they came back home to see the so, family. So, you know, what's interesting about that. Is that means that all of these people were bringing money into their community. In fact, it's actually brilliant, right? Because your communities don't die and disappear because of a mass exodus. You're bringing That's money right. into the local That's economy. Right. Right. Wow. I mean, there's a pain point to that. I mean, having to travel for six hours a week, I guess. Yes. But, wow. So that was this generation. Now, the later generation, like myself and... Uh, like Generation Y or what is it called, but most of them actually moved to like Munich or Cologne, Frankfurt, because there were the jobs. And because they were young, they didn't have family, they didn't have houses, it was easier for them to move. But for like my parents and this kind of generation who like never moved, they went to a place, they built a house, that's it, they're gonna die there. And uh, hopefully they, they will live long, but that's kind of their model. That, so moving for them was never an option. And that's why this, this commuting 
and you're right, they basically sticked uh, there, which was good by the time for these communities because like they had nothing. And so if people start leaving, then even worse, right? Yeah, we see that in the U.S. in the in the manufacturing towns and like, you know, in a, in those st in those South Dakota, the Dakota states and things. You, you hear about these mining towns and manufacturing towns that are just just about gone because everybody had to leave. Yes, yes. Wow. Right. And so, to back to your question, <laughs> the uh, my dad then got an offer to build like they this company wanted to open a branch in. Um, in East Germany, and by the time this happened, like a lot of uh, companies from West Germany started to open branches in East Germany uh, for different reasons. But he was lucky to become kind of the head of one of these branches, and so that actually was uh, at our house. Basically, they built the company there, right at our uh, like uh, mini campus that we had. And so I, as a kid, grew up with um, lots of cars and trucks and. Uh, a lot of people coming and going because you know it was we had our house and next to the house was a small building where the the company was <laughs> the headquarter of the company and so my dad needed computers that was 94 i would say 93 94 where then he, he basically came back to build the, to, to build the business and i still remember it was the day or the time right before the release of windows 95 and we all remember that operating system too well. So my dad gave me a task to say, look, how old was I? I think I was 12 years old. And I was into computers. Like I had a, um, by the time I had a Commodore uh, C64, but I was just playing and I had no like background on programming, nothing. And I wasn't really into it. I was mostly in play. Uh, like I was not really an engineer mindset by the time. And uh, so my dad gave me this task. Look, uh, so we need, we need computers. We need office stuff. And um, so help me figure out. So we went to a little shop, um, uh, like 10 miles from, from where we lived, and we went shopping. We basically shopped PCs. And my dad said, okay, so here we have PCs for with this Windows something, Windows 95, and here is OS2, IBM OS2. Which one should we pick? I was like, wow. I don't know. And <laughs> maybe because of a discount, he picked OS2. <laughs> he did. Yeah. He did. Yeah. Wow. Oh my, so, this is this is super interesting. Okay, and this is yeah, like around so, 94. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it was maybe 95, 96, because by the time we had the option between Windows 95 and OS 2. And so uh, it might have been like 90, 95 or 96. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we get OS 2, and this was completely off what I experienced. So I had no clue what was going on. And so I basically told my dad, look, if you want me to help, then we need this Windows thing because you, you see all these advertisements and, and, and commercials on Windows. Windows was everywhere. And it's like, oh, we need Windows. So we went back to the shop. We bought Windows copies and then we set everything up uh, on Windows because it had, had a UI. I didn't really have to program or like um, do a lot of like terminal stuff by, by the time. But then there was a worker, a coworker for my dad he was, I don't know where and how it came because they were, an, and like this was an electronic, like ele electricity company. So they weren't doing computers. They were just using computers for, for like their uh, payment shops, right? But uh, that guy actually knew how to do batch programming, Windows batch. And so he opened an editor and he did open these kind of bat files, dot bat, B A T. And he did, uh, he wrote down stuff and like just plain batch, a batch, right? But I was like, oh, this is magic. This is this is what I want to become. I want to understand this. And I still see him sitting next to me, him hacking this kind of stuff. And I ask him questions. So what are you doing here? What are you doing there? And I don't remember anything what he did there. And it was, for me, it was magic, even though it was just batch, <laughs> basically. Did he teach you anything? Were you able to do some of that as well or no? So I picked up snippets and I got a better understanding of uh, like peeking behind a the UI curtain of Windows, so to say, because I was a UI user and I wasn't really into uh, writing these um, auto exe bad files and all the crazy stuff that you had by the time. But I, I, I picked stuff up to help my dad when he was into trouble with some stuff. But I don't really, really recall anything. Uh, but I found it magic. I, I would say this was the magic point in my life, which got me really later into computers, I would say. Like this is this moment, right? And you're like 12, 13 years old when yes, this is happening. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So between that time where I imagine it's not full time, I mean, you're going to school, but you're spending some time in that office, you're spending some time 
with support, mainly because yes. you want to, yes. or mainly just because your dad's like, yes. we need help and you've got to get yes. involved. Yes. Yeah. That's right. So at that point, I'm really curious, between that time and then by the time you finish your kind of school before university, are you now kind of saying that this is something I want to learn or is it just something that you're doing on the side and you're, are you doing other things like sports or music or is it computers at this point for you? Yeah, music, uh, good point. So um, I, um, we played sports, but mostly just hobby. Uh, I wasn't a foot, uh, no, soccer club, not football. <laughs> I wasn't a soccer club, and, uh, but, uh, but I wasn't particularly doing well there. So it was just on the weekends. Uh, music came actually when I was 15. So that was at the time where I really got into music because I had friends at school and so we did a lot of music. S computers were still there, so I, I bought uh, like all of these magazines and like what's new in graphics cards and which fan do you need to use to make your system super cool and super quiet. I was mostly in hardware. I wasn't really, even though I was interested in this kind of batch stuff that um, that guy from my dad's company showed me, I lost a little bit that track by the time and I went more into hardware, like putting stuff together, assembling my own PCs, this kind of stuff. Uh, and again, this was all like after school. So I, I basically didn't say, oh, I need to drop school because this is all I want to do. I, I hadn't this thought um, by that time. It was just a small natural progression to later my career and because I always wanted to be in computers. But then music came and then girls, obviously. So I got a little bit distracted for some time on uh, to get where I am right now. But you were essentially doing IT for your father's yes. business, right? I mean, that's yes, where it that's was right. coming from. The that's need right. he had of you wasn't to write batch scripts. It was to keep these computers up and running. And yes, I imagine down. you were learning networking yeah. too and, yep. Yep. and, and yep. all of that, right? Was he paying you at all for your time or this was just, this is what you uh, did? Yeah, so um, I wasn't employed there, so I didn't get like money. I, did, I, I didn't even ask for it. But the net benefit of um, uh, of his job there and leading this this branch office was that he earned good money. So we we were able to do like some real trips to different countries, which we weren't able to do during uh, the time before the, the wall actually came down. So that was a net benefit, and so I was just happy to help. And I was lucky to grow up in in a healthy family as well. But didn't you, at some point, as you're getting older and you're, and you're 15 and you're 16 and you're getting into music and you need to make money, so are you doing any sort of work to earn money on top of all of that as well? That's a good question. So uh, I wasn't basically when, before I finished high school, um, and so high school here means like 17, 18 years old uh, in Germany, um, then usually you have to make this choice of where you want to go next. You want to go to university, you want to go work. And by the time in Germany, it was still enforced to do either civil or military service for at least a year. So they shrink that down. It was like three years and then it got less and less and less. And when I had to do it, it was still a year. So that gave me a little bit more time to stretch out this decision, uh, the university decision, right? And so it was good because by that time I was really into music. Uh, so we were playing a lot and uh, basically after school, it was all music. Computers faded a little bit out of... Um, out of my interest in, in, in that time. And so I used that year after high school, that civil, I, I did civil service, I didn't went to the military, uh, military I, so I did civil service. I used that year to earn money, because you, you get money, uh, at least by the time you got some, some money for this work, and to pay my uh, music, like guitars and, and, and all the stuff that, that you need. But it was enough to, I was still living with my parents, so it was enough to uh, do the music and, and still have a good life. But for during school, I didn't need any money because like it was school was free and so. Civil service meant what? Walking around and cleaning the streets? Did it mean like what did it mean? I, I'm not because yeah, we yeah. don't have this concept. So um, it's actually a spectrum. The usual job in civil service is to go to hospitals or um, places where they, they treat or cure uh, people or children uh, whatsoever and to help them out. And then because um, there was a saying back in the day that um, these these companies or hospitals, they were just waiting for these civil civil service to come to do the dirty job. <laughs> <to> do <laughs> I was lucky and this was 
mostly due to my mother because I was into music, so I didn't have time to look where I want to go. And I, that was just one, um, one thing, uh, priority was to stay where I was. Like some people actually had to move to do civil service because they didn't find something. So I was like, hey, I just need to stay here because I had my friends and my music there. And my mother basically looked around and she found a place, a hospital uh, um, uh, with different like, uh, like psychologies and pediatric stations. So it was a huge hospital by the time, but I didn't want to go on these, um, uh, uh, like ICUs or any of these stations, I was lucky to get into administration. And the only requirement there was to do shifts. So they had a morning shift, they had an afternoon shift, and they had a night shift. And so they were lucky to have me because nobody wanted to do the night shifts. And uh, so I was basically on duty almost every night there to do like um, just to collect papers and stamp papers and put them somewhere. It's mostly administ boring administration tasks. But it seems that working nights would have conflicted with your music if you're playing gigs. Yes. Unless you only played gigs on the weekends or something. Like, which we did, which we did by the time. Because my friends, they also, like, because we're all the same age, they were either on civil service or maybe just started their job. So on the week, um, we, there was no gig. And so it was mostly on the weekend. And so I, I had an arrangement to say, look, uh, on the weekend, either I do morning shift or you get me free because uh, I was coming out of night shift on Thursday or Friday. And so you usually had to have a day off anyways. Were you getting paid at least at some point? The yes. Band? Like, were you... Yeah thinking that at this during this year right you've able to structure your life around time and a little money for the band i mean i have to imagine that the band right now is your your big focus are you thinking yes, that yes. this is going to turn into something more professional or do you still just think this is a hobby in that year uh that's a good question i don't exactly recall and still it was pre before youtube it was before i tunes and spotify so even though the competition was probably not too high because not everyone could afford and do it it was still hard to from your little village or town to become uh, popular and so i think a couple of our uh, teammates our bandmates they had this thought and actually one of our uh, like our drummer he went to music school so for him there was a there was a path for myself uh, I don't think, I, I think it was mostly the money, which I was like, uh, that's probably not going to be sustainable for a long time unless you're becoming like an ACDC or a uh, very famous uh, band. So I think even there it was clear to me that music is, uh, it's going to be important, so I, I tried to uh, sustain it, but I had to have a job to pay the music basically. All right, so now you're, you're finishing up this year of service. Yes. You're now really backs up against the wall now you've got to figure yes. out what you're going to do yep. right yep. um yep. and i have to imagine that you were probably helping fix some of the computers during the the night shift as well because you had the most experience probably right so what happened is uh, during civil service you obviously have to or even like military service whatever you do you have to think about your next step right because at some point it ends you can extend to a couple of months but basically there's a next step coming and for me, it was either university or basically find a company to work for. And so I don't know in the, in, in the US uh, if there is such a system, but the, um, if you don't go to university after high school, you still have to get a job qualification. It's not just like, you oh, okay, I've got my high school diploma or whatever. And then you go to a company, knock, knock, I want to work for you. You still need a qualified, like an industry um, job qualification a placement like a, test almost like if you don't score a certain level that industry is locked out from you well let's put it that way and again we are like 2000 this year right which means uh there were a lot of people looking for jobs and there were not a lot of companies offering jobs so the competition was really high so what you want was at least high school qualification then university qualification or a qualified job a training program and so there were like uh, in Germany here, we have a, like a training program where you go for like two or three years to do um, like you go to a school and partial time, part time you go to a company that offer this kind of scholarship or like apprenticeship. It's like a trade school almost, even if it wasn't a particular trade. Exactly. It's not about trades, but the, the model is similar, right? You, you go to school, you learn and then you apply. And then I picked that model actually because you earn money during that time because the um, the company pays you because you work for the company so they pay you they pay you a low just like income 
because for them you're still like a burden, quote, quote, because they had to train and educate you, but still you're doing work there. So it's a good balance between getting money, working for a company, being applied in a specific area that you care, and also learning, like you, you go to school. So why would somebody choose university over that? Because they want that academic education? Yes. Or they... Yeah, the title, the qualification. That's true. But you were more being practical at this point, and you're saying, look, I, I want to continue to make money. I, I continue to want to play music. Exactly. I want to continue my lifestyle, whatever it is. Yep, exactly. I had a lifestyle because working for that hospital, I didn't have much money that I spent because I was mostly either working or for the band. So that wasn't like besides the band, there was not, not a lot of money that I burned. So I had a kind of a lifestyle. But then, yeah, the next question is, do you want to drop lifestyle and go to university and then maybe to find some other job and, and go for like four or five years of training? And I didn't even know what because it was so abstract or you make some money and learn something. So what was the, the schooling then you, you got for those three years? What, what, yes. what did you choose to study? Yeah, so fortunately by the time they, they were one of, because this, it's a, it's a country program and they were just dabbling with IT. So there was an IT uh, tradesman kind of role, which was mostly on the business side because they thought IT is more about the business side versus about the actual technology. And when I started this program, they offered two new roles besides this kind of tradesman role, which was um, IT software developer and IT, uh, what was it called? That's what actually, oh, system administration. I think something around system administration. And what and year I, are we talking now? We're talking like 2002? Uh, two, yeah. Two. 2002, okay. Yeah. And so I picked the system administrator because I thought, okay, I'm not smart enough to do programming software developer. Even though they, they actually teach you it, but I was like, oh, I don't get it. So let's do the system stuff because, you know, I was into networking and hardware. So it just wasn't a more natural fit. This, like by today, I'm, got, I'm regretting actually this decision. Um, but by that time, it was just a low bar and I could do music. So Yeah, I'm thinking you were like, I know this already. Yes. So it's not going to, I don't have to spend a lot of time here. Exactly. So, Efficiency. Efficient, and I'm going to keep my life going the way it is. Yes. Because if you had gone the other way, you you really going to need to study, <laughs> right? Exactly, exactly. That was an important time. So the program was there for three years, and I I came to a. It wasn't a company. It was an, a research institute, Max Planck Society. You might know Max Planck, the like uh, inventor of the Planck length, length in physics. So he was a uh, like quantum computing and all the stuff. This person invented it. And later, uh, the, this whole campus and institution got named after Max Planck. And so I was working in a very international uh, environment here in Leipzig. Uh, so they had three institutions here. And one was uh, for mathemat mathematics, one was for neuroscience. Uh, and the one where I went was evolutionary anthropology, which was basically about life and like our origins and roots, which was pretty interesting by the time because they were like doing excavations in Africa and finding bones of like three million years old uh, specimen and so on. So that was actually applied science, which was good. And for me, I was there in central administration to do all the computer and server work. So I got a little bit more into servers now. Did they place you there? Was it like you went into yes, school apply. and then they, okay, so you go, when you went to the school, there were options, you had to apply. Yes. This is one of them. That, but you were guaranteed a work while you were in this program, right? Exactly. That's that's the model. Yeah. So they they had basically had to offer you work and education there as well. So nice. So you get into this applied science company. You're doing the administration side. Yes. With the computers, data probably is a big part of a this. lot of data. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And are you falling in love with this work, or is it still a means to an end to your music. What's going on over the three years? Yes, so I was struggling. I was struggling a little bit uh, with uh, the role in the beginning because they were like, "Yeah, you need to learn Linux, and we have a high bar here." And they were into virtualization already by the time. And I was like, "Oh, well, I'm, I have a Windows background, and virtualization never heard about this before." So the bar was pretty high, at least like mentally for me to like do more and learn more, especially in the beginning to ramp up. And not fail because if you fail during those two or three years, well, then you're basically you lost three years without a qualification. That's oh, yeah. There's still a test. Like after these three years, there's a test, there's a qualification to earn 
uh, that state or country basically praised. If somebody fails this, whatever that means, they do they get to start over? I, or are you just lost yeah. in the system? No, wow. no, they, there's some safety nets there as well. Gotcha. And it, uh, it turned out to be not too hard to crack the bar. And so music was doing actually great during that time. It was like 2002 to four around. So music was great. Job, the work was also interesting. Um, so I balanced them both out. It was basically 50-50 when I was not doing work and I wasn't doing like, I wasn't like nine to five. I was really working hard because I wanted to learn this stuff. I wanted to grow Linux, all these concepts, storage, virtual networks and fiber channel attached storage and all this stuff like this. Those were all new terms back in the days. Uh, which uh, I was just, it felt overwhelming. So I had to learn a lot. And on the other hand, that was still the music. But it sounds like you're almost back in your dad's shop when you started this. You started to find passion and love for the. Yes. Right? And there was an important moment during those three years. So the program runs for three years, but if you are, if you want to go fast, you can basically do it in two or two and a half years. I think two is, a, is the minimum. And so my the company i was working for or the research institution they said look boy we we can't take you over after these three years because we just because it's a public entity they can't just create jobs and so they they had basically nothing to offer for me in the central administration world because the the, the number of job wrecks there are fixed they can't just create job wrecks because it's a huge process and your seat needs to go to another student i imagine yep exactly which it's is rolling. interesting yep so, oh. and here's the point, because this institute um, was, you know, there's directors and different learning um, practices that they have. They were just creating another practice. Um, human, evolu uh, human evolution was kind of a new practice that they wanted to create there. And so a director came and the director brought his stuff. And so they, they needed someone to do uh, the administration of, uh, of the team. So they were looking for someone. Now they were in a rush because the first thing that you need to, if you want to like build out a new um, group is you need IT, especially if you're doing research and all this stuff. And so my, my, my boss by the time in central administration came to me and said, look, if you want a job, I can't give you one because like our like wrecks are frozen. This is your chance, but you need to like accelerate your uh, path, your qualification, because they need you like in April and not I don't know, September or whenever I would have finished. And so I had to pull forward the qualification. And because the bar, because I was efficient and it was a topic that I was interested in, I qualified earlier. And so I became the, the head of um, this department for, for IT. Coming right out of school, finishing it. Timing is everything, isn't it? Yes, yes. Because I got nervous when you started saying how these jobs that you're getting through this program I have to imagine rarely turn into employment because yep. that you need to bring more students in. So now I yep. start to get nervous about, well, none of these companies associated with this program provide employment. Where are you going to find employment? Yes. But you got lucky that they were expanding yeah. and you took, yep. you took advantage of that. Yes. Um, because the other, like the alternative would have been like do the qualification and then go somewhere else to find a job, which usually means you move uh, to Munich or Frankfurt to one of these larger cities, which I didn't want because music. Yeah. So when you start this new job, you're done with your schooling. What year? Well, now we're talking maybe 2004 or five. Yes. I think it was four transitioning to five. In, into time. five. Yes. And now yes. you're completely finished with school. Yes. You still have your music, music but you're I guess in your head now, you're starting to see that this is going to be my career. Is your head now wrapped around the idea that this is going to be my career? Uh, good question for the one place, um, because by the time I was, I was actually not worried about staying too long in one place. So I listened to Brian's uh, uh, interview with you that, you that you did, Brian Lyles, right? And I think in those three years, he had like 20 jobs. I, I'm still at the same com company, <laughs> so totally different, right? Totally different. But I was, I didn't want to move. It, everything was good. I didn't earn a lot of money because it was public institution. So obviously they, they look for like money and all this stuff, but I could do my music. And, and I, I, ha I had a girlfriend by the time. So I want, I wanted the stability. I didn't want to like. How old are you? You're 22, 23 at this point. Exactly. And so all life was good. And during that time. 
And because I became this department administrator for the group, which later grew, like grew to like 65 or 70 people, um, I, I had a lot of work. Um, there was daunting work, which like installing stuff and like Windows issues and helping someone to figure out how to do a Korean um, keyboard layout on Windows <laughs> or a Macintosh, so this kind of stuff. But then I was still, because the, this group was growing and they needed a lot of data for this, these 3D analytics that they were doing, I had to build out backend systems for this, like massive scalable server and storage platforms, which we used Linux, which means build yourself uh, during the time. So they proprietary about. databases or were you also focusing on open source at this time? Yeah, I was too? using mostly open source because, you know, we had a, the, the issue there was at this institute was if there were certain thresholds of money you could spend and above, I think, 200K or so, you had to do huge tender RFP kind of styles. And so we were always trying to stay below that limit of spend because it, it made our lives easier in terms of getting equipment. And so that means you couldn't buy enterprise software. Like we, most of the stuff actually ran on Linux, open source stuff. The databases were like MySQL, Postgres, uh, file services were Samba, Linux files. So everything was open source. So what's interesting to me is I feel like your music is causing you to be complacent with the work because you don't want to disturb that. My dad passed up promotion after promotion because he wanted to play his music. Mm -hmm. um, and he did that and he loved it, right? And mm -hmm. he, had, he had no regrets over it. It wasn't about work and money for him. It was about music. The mm -hmm. work was a means to an end. So I'm kind of feeling the same way, right? Yes, here. yes. But yes. you must still now at 23 in 2004, 5, still, mm -hmm. you st must be getting paid for your music. You must be playing. Are you gone? Have you gone beyond bars? Are you doing weddings? Are you doing parties? Is, is there some form of a career still potentially in music? So I think we peaked 2004, 5 um, in terms of we were successful by means of our standards. So we played every weekend, we toured through Europe, we had CDs, we did records, we sold stuff. Um, but it became clear that the effort to actually make a business out of this was too high. And nobody in the band, maybe besides the drummer, was ready to give up the work, the safety net that we had, and basically trade it for a career in music. And the the other bands that we played with, we, like who were like older and told us how it is to be on the road and try to earn money, none of them were successful. And so this was kind of an indicator for us to basically say that's maybe just going to be a hobby uh, for life. But when does this band finally break up? Or, or are you still playing with the band? No, no, exactly. <laughs> Two years later, uh, Two 2007, years later. Yeah, huge, huge brownout. <laughs> All right, so now you're like 25 in 2007, and you're not doing this music anymore, at least yes. the way you were. And now yes. you're even more heads down yep. on the job. What eventually gets you out of this company? Right? What? what when is, what is the next job and why do you end up taking that chance? Exactly. And this was the important moment that then settled the path to where I am right now, which was my, um, my now wife, back in the day, girlfriend, she didn't find a job in, in our state, uh, not in our city, not in our state. So, so she wrote 15 applications, 14 in our state, one in Munich. She got back one, which was in Munich. <laughs> so she moved, she had to move. And then it was up to me to say, uh, and basically decide if I want to also move to stay with her or we'll break up, right? And um, obviously there wasn't, uh, option B was never there. So I definitely wanted to move for her, which was good. And um, so I moved to Munich and for me, it was easy to find a job there because I'm in IT, uh, the industry was flourishing before the crisis. I'm, I'm going to interrupt you for a second. Yes, yes, please. Was the music already done or was that also a catalyst for saying that I, I can't be in this band anymore? Because that, mm. I have to imagine the band would have been a difficult, if that was also part of the decision. Yeah, so the band turned out to be not the problem. In fact, I'm, before the band actually broke up, I kind of branched and created another band because you know, you see these things coming, at least some people do. And so I had another band by the time, which was more like a weekend project. 
And uh, so I took the band basically with me because we could do, by the time we got internet, broadband, and I could do a lot over internet. And so even though I physically moved away from the new band, from the new group, we could still play together. And we would see each weekend because my wife and I, we basically went back to our friends almost every weekend. But this was the also the first time you're living outside your parents' home, right? Like, this isn't uh, this is a big decision. You're actually leaving. Your, you, I imagine you're still with your, in your parents. So you're Close about to, to live parents. on your own, yeah. right? You're about to live on your own. And I imagine you're going to move in with your girlfriend, too. You're not going to have separate... Space. So this is a huge life-changing Yeah, there decision. were a lot of changes in that year, that for sure. Yeah, like, um, even though I was not living in my parents' house anymore, but we were still living, like, we were close, right? Uh, I saw my parents almost every day, if you will, uh, because physically, proximity. Now, we move away, like, from the state, from where we grew up, both, like, my wife and I. Uh, I get a new job, the band breaks up, and... Um, I, like career wise I wasn't progressing I was more like yeah I'm just gonna do Linux in that company and not in that company anymore but still it was there were a lot of changes in that year it was 2007 so you moved to Munich now but did you move after you found a job or you just went there and said I'll find a job when I get on the ground I so I'm my wife moved and for me <clears throat> I was still in Leipzig to find a new job so not just like moving and finding a job there. I was basically trying to find, while still being at the company, finding a new job in, in Munich. And that, that went pretty quick. So I think five months later or so, I also moved with a job. Nice. And what, what, what was this company doing? So they were doing consulting. And here's, a, here's an interesting story, at least for me. Uh, so they, I applied there for a job as a VMware administrator and consultant. Did and you know VMware at the time? <laughs> were you using that tech? Yeah, so we were using it at the research institute that I was working on, but I was not responsible for maintaining it. I was just a user, right? I knew how to create a VM, but it didn't ha have to set up the hypervisor and all the stuff. Gotcha. Now, gotcha. obviously, this role required it. So I was on a plane. I, before boarding the plane, I bought a book from now a very good friend that I have. He, he wrote that book and later we basically met and, and I told him the story. And so that flight was like a 50 minute flight. I read the book, it was easily written, so I, it was pretty fast. Everything is fresh in my mind. I go to the interview, they ask me some simple questions. I like impress them with, yeah, you can write some crazy scripts and there's this shortcut because everything was fresh in my mind. I just had to basically cite from the book. Nice. And they were impressed and it's like, you, you get the job. <laughs> so this is like 2008 then imagine yes you exactly. just got a job because you're able to um, regurgitate Read. everything that you <laughs> and now they're like here do it and then you're like what I, I guess you're like I can do this it's not a problem yeah uh, I think this was the first time where I was like um, uh, moving a little bit beyond the edge um, because usually I'm trying to be in my comfort zone doing things perfect and trying to understand before uh, doing something this time it was like totally the opposite basically not, not having any clue and going out in the wild but they gave me i was i was a quick learner and so i think that pretty much helped and so you give me tech i read it i, I dabble with it and you, i i croak basically the essence and so i became a consultant um for a large ins insurance company so they did body leasing right so i went to this insurance company i worked there for like 10 months i got a call from a friend who i worked with at the research institute still in 2008 because he also left the research institute that we both worked together and he went to dell dell computers and he called me and said hey you know we're looking for someone like a field guy and systems engineer um, at dell in bavaria for the, to cover the bavarian region which like munich and uh, everything around there like nuremberg you've you've been there, right so basically uh, in, in the south of, of germany they, they were looking for someone um and he said it's it's great you earn a lot of money it's great stuff and you know all the stuff just just apply and he helped me so i applied what was it about that job that you thought was going to be better than you were was it the travel was it the working mm -hmm. with different people like because you, you had a nice job, you're learning. Like, what was it about that job that made you do that? I think it's two reasons. First, he spoiled me with money. He basically said, oh, <laughs> like, this was the first time where I was actually looking in, uh, into money because uh, at the research institute, the, um, the whole like loan and social benefits, they were fixed. 
yes, everyone cheated here and there, but you, you progressed after two years, you get more, you get a pay raise done. In like private uh, economy, well, we know it depends on how you negotiate, right? And how you perform. And so I learned based on that first company in, in Munich that I worked for, I learned that other people were earning more, other people were earning less than me. I was like, oh, wh why is that? And so he, he basically called me, uh, the guy, like my friend at Dell and said, look, that's great money. Uh, you're definitely going to love it and we can work together. Um, so it's going to be great. But the main point was I got bored out at this company, at the insurance company, because, you know, we were writing architect letters and reviews and papers and technical stuff, but some stuff never got into production. There was a lot of politics. So actually I got really bored out. And, and in fact, I got sick, uh, like during that time as well. So now you get to use your hands again. You get to be in the field again. Yes. You yes. get to make the money that you know you're worth over at Dell. And now it's like, again, we're like 2008, 2009. Yep, exactly. So, so how long are you at? We got like 15 more minutes here. So I want to make sure we, we get to where you yep. are now. But how long are you at, at Dell? And is it the same role that whole time? or? Yeah, I was there at seven years, uh, for seven years. And I had two or three different roles, but they were all field related, either consulting uh, or like systems engineer field work. Seven this, years is a long yeah. time, at yeah. least today and today. Were you no, still true. working with? So Dell has a cloud. So I, I'm super interested in what you learned at Dell over those seven years. And were you moving towards the cloud technologies for Dell too? Um, to the last question, no. It was mostly the whole on-prem assets, and I was in the in the server business for Dell, like not computer, like laptops also. I was, I was in the back end stuff. Um, but what I learned is working for an American company because it was my first American company that I worked for, right? And you gotta love it or hate it, so, something like that. I, I loved it. Like I, I loved the international atmosphere. It's kind of what I had at this research institute. A lot of like, like people from the U.S. all over the place, and. So I got to learn and practice the language even more, more. So that was definitely a plus. The company itself was huge. So the structure is different, learning a lot at all these training programs and everything that you learn and adapt to grow at that point in time. So that was very important for, for myself. But over those seven years, I also felt that the cloud and um, HTML5 and web apps and all this stuff started to eat our lunch. At least that was my feeling. And so I was like, okay, what am I going to do like in 10 or 15 years? I'm still going to be at Dell selling storage or server. Like the, the world's moving on, the world is moving up the stack. And I was still figuring out cabling diagrams for this kind of uh, stuff. And I thought I need to change something. And so a friend of mine, by the time at Dell, but later he moved to VMware, gave me a call and said, look, you need to come to VMware, work for VMware. Because it's an amazing company. We do software. Software is going to be the, the future. Software eats the world, like Mark Andreessen. And so that was in 15 where I got a call to um, get a, basically apply for VMware. I think it's fascinating that you saw the world moving towards, you know, what do they call You know, general hardware, where yeah. it's the software running on the general hardware, right? And that you saw people kind of trying to move to the cloud in terms of not having to maintain these data centers anymore, or at least with the promise of that. Yes. And the promise right. of cost. So you saw that. But you were also in the field mm -hmm. with these clients who were, yep. I mean, so you must have been seeing these clients struggle with cost, struggle with tech, struggle with, were you already seeing the promise of the cloud based on what your customers were dealing with? So that was like, let's say 13, 14. And by the time the cloud in Germany was still like a bad word. Nobody wanted to go to the cloud. At least nobody was definitely doubling down on it besides some like high stakes uh, companies. And so I did, even though I saw these companies struggling because IT was moving slow, the, all these silos and all the stuff, the promise was, we're never gonna move to the cloud. Bandwidth, security, compliance, not gonna make it. So I did not, I can't say that I saw it by my clients that they moved and the business basically moved. But what I did is I saw it from the Googles and the Amazons, what they built on top of commodity hardware. And I was like, how can you build more reliable stuff on commodity stuff because I sold enterprise storage arrays like highly expensive highly available and all the stuff it's like why isn't Google buying from us why isn't Amazon buying from us how are they actually be building better oh. software products than we do and so this was where it clicked for me is like maybe the world if, if that trend continues 
And even if our clients, whether they go to the cloud or not, but if they use that software, that open source stuff, and put it on a commodity hardware, well, yes, we'll still sell servers, which Dell did and still does. But for the rest, like networking equipment and all the stuff, that's going to be struggling. And so I, I felt that I had to adapt. But how did you know the person who did reach out to you from VMware? I, I, I'd like to understand the relationship. Yep. Because if you're in this one place for seven years, are you going to meetups? Are you involved in community? Or, I would imagine at Dell you'd be in a silo. So yeah. how did you meet this person? How did you know this person? What what? How did that all come about? Yeah, so he was, by the time he was at VMware, and he was a specialist for virtual desktop computing, like VDI and all this stuff. And I was at Dell, and I had a specialist role to do virtual desktop and terminal services, but for Citrix. And so he was always there at Dell, and because of the partnership and, and all the stuff, he was like, hey, Michael, nice to see you. Are you still into Citrix, or you want to look at our stuff? And so we were battling, and we became good friends. That's how we met. And by the time I was still thinking that Citrix and VMware and VDI, that's going to be the new way of computing, like on the desktop, you know, these days we know better. <laughs> wow. Okay. So this was somebody you were kind of in competition with in yes. terms of that Friendly tech. competition. Friendly, yes. which is nice, right? Because yes. um, you both respected each other. You respected yes. your knowledge. You respected your job, your roles. Yes. Um, and so he ends up, yeah, he's in VMware, and it, he realizes he mm -hmm. needs somebody like you. Yep. And so he yep. takes a chance to reach out and say, are you interested? Yes. And so he sent me a couple of job uh, recs. And uh, again, I applied for a field role. The interview goes well. And they offer me a job, and I declined. Hmm. And what was the job that they wanted you to have? Or you just... you. Um, it was kind of a field role, yeah, so like a consultant, field consultant. But I declined because somehow I didn't feel like this is the job I, I want to do. Two weeks later, I still think about it. No, he actually called me. He's like, that's a, that's a big mistake. Yeah, well, I mean, you should definitely come here. And then I think about it, and it's like, maybe it's a mistake. Maybe software is going to be the future. Maybe this company is going to be the future. So let's apply there. And so I had another, like another interview round, which was a little bit more hard because they were like, are you serious this time? Or is it another joke? And so uh, I, I got the, the, the job in 15. Wow. So you had this kind of pause, this yes. second guessing of yourself that yeah. because it was so new, you were like, ah. Oh. And then yeah. your, your buddy convinced you. And, and luckily, they gave you another yeah. chance. Yes, exactly. But it was. I feel like you took a lateral move, that it really was the same job you were doing at Dell, just with a different tech, right? Yes, I agree, yes. So yeah. how long are you doing that job before you, per I mean, is it between then and the push to Kubernetes that you're kind of still doing that work? What, what's yep. So there was one important, like maybe the second most important moment in my career was, you know, I come to VMware and the whole door opens up with uh, all the stuff, the fancy stuff they were doing. By the time they were also obviously already looking into Kubernetes and how to like build a product around uh, Kubernetes. So I, I had to do all these start program, like onboarding stuff. And uh, basically I had the videos running. And by the time I was also looking at all these internal tech documents, what is Kubernetes, what is it all about? So I learned Kubernetes. I've kind of fallen in love with this new way of doing things, of building and running distributed applications. And but Kubernetes was new to you when you moved to VMware. Yes. yes. That was that on your radar screen? Was that part of the interview process? They said you were no. focusing. No. Not it, at all. No. Okay. Just out of curiosity, right? And so I, I thought this could see this Kubernetes uh, thing. I was like, this sounds interesting. And all these different terms, I didn't even understand them, right? Like reconciliation loops and control patterns, and distributed systems and etcd and quorum. I'm reading this, and I was like, this sounds interesting, but I don't know it. So I keep, I keep on reading, 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 and I fall in love with distributed systems. This was the time where I basically fall in love with the whole concept of like truly distributed systems. And But I still had my daily job at VMware. Uh, but like I, I, by the time I, I, I told my, my colleagues that during the day I'm Bruce Wayne, I'm doing my job, and at night I become Batman, and I take the Kubernetes head on and turn, turn down the rabbit hole. Do you remember the first time you saw the word Kubernetes, or because you you seem to 
really believe in the tech, but I'm, I'm curious, what was the first time that it popped into your radar screen that caused you to be Batman at night? Uh, yes, so again, I think it, it happened at VMware where, you know, they were thinking about how to move from VMs to containers and build a platform like f for both of this, this kind of stuff. So there was a partial family technology like VMs and this kind of stack. I knew about Google and uh, Amazon doing massive scale cloud on top of commodity hardware. And here comes Kubernetes and containers with the promise of like, you know, you package it up and then you deploy it anywhere and the system, the whole machinery will, will take over for you. And that's where I got interested in Kubernetes. Because I was like, I can actually run Google infrastructure like myself here on my computer. I, I have to imagine that somebody in VMware is trying to build this technology too. Yes. Right? Because yes. everybody was yes. trying to build it themselves. Yes. Kubernetes became the open source of, right? Yes. Were you, were you hearing anything inside of VMware uh, obviously, you know, what you can say, where people were, there must have been a debate on whether to stick with proprietary tech or to go Kubernetes. Uh, yeah, so by the time I was new to the company and I was still based out of like Germany, so my, I had a local role in Germany, so I was lucky to have access to these different design documents and, and, and write-ups, but I wasn't part of any of these engineering discussions that I'm part of right now. And so I could just read and learn. And I, I didn't even have an opinion around it. It was like, what should we do? Should we do Kubernetes or should, should like, this st just started forming over the years. And by the time I was just fascinating about tech. Your work at the office of the CTO, which I love that. I just, just yes. astounded, I work. So, <laughs> and your boss, Frank Deneman, right? Tell everybody a little bit about quickly his background, because I think it's important related yeah. to the work you're doing. So just for the record, Frank is not my boss, but a very good oh. colleague. No, no, yeah, sorry, yeah, I, sorry, I thought he was, I, I apologize, okay. No, we work, like, we work closely together because he's also a chief technologist at VMware, right? And so there's, um, I wouldn't say overlap, but we collaborate on, on different areas, especially because he's very much into resource management, which, you know, if you're into Kubernetes, uh, things match up pretty nicely. And so um, I'm lucky here at VMware to have a boss like after, like when I started, I had a different boss. He was great. But then I got more into Kubernetes and I want to turn my night job into my day job. And so I basically progressed later than into this role at uh, Office of the CTO. And I had a, a good mentor and a good friend and now my manager who basically helped me uh, during that journey. And he's based out of um, um, basically California. So uh, I'm now reporting and working for, for him directly in his team. And so I became associated with the headquarter at VMware, which opened a lot of doors for myself as well. Yeah, I, I'm really, in, uh, uh, what I want to hear, because I think it will help people, is how you were able to, or, or what happened that got you to know these people, the right people, because the, the, yeah. you wanted to work with Kubernetes yes, in your day yes. job. I imagine yes. you knew what group was doing that. So we had an internal like Facebook um, system uh, at VMware, where like people could chat and, and basically hang out. So that was pre-Slack uh, back in the days. And so there we were debating and I was contributing from my field experience. Hey, this customer spoke about Kubernetes and they want it this way. And so naturally the PMs, the product managers and engineers, they were still listening. Okay, so how should we build a product? And, and so I got in touch with them. This is kind of where it linked. The stuff that I wrote made sense to them. So it was helpful for them. and. The more I learn and grow, um, the more also they started like working closer with me because they saw me as a peer and not just hey, a guy like listening to the customers and being the voice from the customers, but actually having opinions on how to build products. That opened the door, like this, this platform that we had internally to communicate. I love that. I, yes. I mean, I think people listening to this, if you're a business owner or you're a manager, um, two things there, right? right? That there was a space that allowed anyone in the company to kind of collaborate thoughts and ideas to help the product and help those teams. Yes, yes. And I've been in environments where people that were working in the field with the customer were always treated as kind of second class. Um, but you're in the field, you know the customers. But I think what it sounds like is you did more than just complain for the customer. You must have also been trying to provide potential solutions. Yes. Right, yeah. and and yeah. and people started to see that as valuable. 
Exactly. And you know, by the time Kubernetes didn't win, right, that came later. So there was Massosphere, there was Docker, Docker Swarm and all these different platforms. So we actually had debate on which technology should we pick. And um, that, that's where I also helped because I, I had a perspective on Mesos and these kind of platforms where some other folks were mostly into Kubernetes. And so we had a lot of like debates, like healthy and technical debates on what, 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 what we should do. Obviously later Kubernetes won. Um, but this was also very important in terms of to arbitrate and get the message and the product actually right at the end of the day. Were you at all intimidated in the beginning having these conversations? How did you fight through some of that if you were, or maybe you weren't? I'm, uh, I'm kind of curious. Exactly. I was lucky because the, the atmosphere was always friendly uh, on the platform. And so it was a very open and welcoming. And this is really important, right? You don't want to build up like mantle or uh, like artificial barriers to make it hard for, I would say, non-engineers to contribute to the engineering side of things. And so it was very open. And uh, I was in calls and everything was public pu internally shared, uh, like in terms of conference, like meetings and all this stuff. You, you could just click and access and, and watch the recording and then say, hey, look, I watched this recording and here's my, here's my view on this. It's a very open and friendly space. And I think this is important for any kind of company out there to lower the barriers, give more trust to the people, right? This is a lot of trust here when you open up all the internals and the engineering internals to, to non-engineers that I was by the time, um, but it, it helped to collaborate and give diff get different perspectives and for you to form the relationships that allowed yes. you to be yep. where you are right now so exactly we've got a couple more minutes left and I'm um, you've now been at VMware for almost six yeah. almost six years so you did your yep. seven years at Dell you're coming in seven years in <laughs> VMware I know VMware has publicly made a a huge commitment to Kubernetes they're, they're yep. really right I mean I don't want to call it a shift in the business model because the VM is so important underneath it. Yes, yes. Um, but they're, they're, they're hedged down with Kubernetes. So do you see yourself, it's just an interesting question for me. Like, I, I imagine right now you're very happy and you don't see yourself moving on from VMware, but mm -hmm. I, I, it would be curious since you've been in this space for so long. Are, what are you, are you starting to smell a change that's coming that that could affect the industry two, three, five years down the road like Kubernetes has? Are you starting to yeah. kind of smell something? I think, and maybe this is obvious, but I think the cloud is real. Like, you know, five years ago, at least here in, in, in Germany, everyone's like, I'm oh, never going to go to the cloud. Now the cloud is re real and it's going to stay, right? So it's not something that you are against the cloud because you can't can compete. The question is, how can you monetize on top of the cloud? And this is, I think, where Kubernetes helps the, because the API, right? And you see all these different cloud players, even AWS, um, basically having a Kubernetes offering. Now the change, I think, that I see coming is, and you could compare it a little bit with Linux, is that right now we're all, we'll, I love Kubernetes and I've been focusing on Kubernetes and teaching and educating and writing about Kubernetes because I find it fascinating. But the, the outcome of this was also that people were thinking, oh, I need to learn Kubernetes, this reaction, right? And people from all the places, like be it the field people, be it a software developer, business developer, now going down and all the like, YAML stuff. And I think this is where we have to be careful. This is, I think, the shift that we need to see is that it's not about Kubernetes, which a lot of these, like even Joe Beta says, right? It's a platform for building platforms. So we don't fall into this trap of learning and having to learn and the desire to learn Kubernetes because it's not about Kubernetes. It's ultimately at the stuff that you run on top of Kubernetes. And whether it's a function that runs on Kubernetes or it's a function that runs somewhere else or it's a business app that runs on a different platform, ultimately you're going to solve a business problem. And I think that's the shift that we also need to see in the industry because the industry happens to be often too much about the thing versus the actual outcome. And right now the thing is Kubernetes, which is great because otherwise we wouldn't have come that far. But on the other hand, I hope we don't just focus too much on Kubernetes because I, I tell my friends, if you run a PowerPoint on a laptop, you don't have to read the source codes for like the Windows kernel and be an expert there. And similar to this is what I think is Kubernetes right now. It's a low level primitive, which is important. It's great, but we need to move on. One of the things I wonder since Kubernetes is basically running on cloud computing, which is basically running on virtual machines, right? Do I get to feel confident that my application is running efficiently because the Kubernetes installation is efficient, because the VM is efficient, 
And do I get to feel comfortable that the VM, the VM layer knows what Kubernetes needs and will adapt to what it needs, just like Kubernetes knows right. what my applications need right. and they'll right. adapt. Is that, at a, at a high level, what's happening? Is that core work that happens at VMware Make yes. sure that my Kubernetes yeah. is running automatic, automatically efficiently. Yeah, and uh, I mean we're not there yet. Like I, I wish we were there. We just push the button and everything is like running at best at capacity as efficient and as fast as possible. And there's a lot of things that naturally need to evolve and get like deeper integrated between these different layers. And I gave a talk two years ago where like I draw just the resource management layers from the app down to the hardware, like uh, five, five, six layers in between, which all need to be like configured and fine tuned on each other. And I think that's a very important um, task that we at VMware have while building out these products that whatever stack and layer you use and where you're at, you're getting the best gain basically for, for the money. But do I need on staff someone who can be make sure that all the knobs are allowing everything to be mechanically sympathetic today? And is the idea that I'll I I won't need that person because the systems can do it? To the first question, yes, you need this person because if something fails and maybe your stack is so special you can't call anyone, so you need definitely want to react, especially if your business is basically on at risk there. The second part of the question, like can we move so high up the stack that the machines will figure out for us, that the software will figure out, and this gets us into AI and AI ops and these kind of fancy terms? I think partially yes, because we will detect patterns, and you see this already in databases where databases adapt to the patterns, the traffic patterns and the workloads that they see. So this is possible, but the more generic and the more broad you go for these kind of workloads, which Kubernetes is, which VMs are, right? It's a very fundamentally very broad kind of tool to do anything. The harder it also gets to arbitrate. But I think maybe 10, 15 years from now on, we'll build machines that are so intelligent. Look at the CPUs, look at the NICs that are in our computers today and even in the service. They are software, right, on, on, the, on the metal. So I think we'll pu push more of these capabilities and responsibilities down to the lower level stacks um, to free the people like you and me from thinking about this stuff. You know, I, I don't compile Linux kernels anymore. I did that 20 years ago and I was happy. I'm happy now that I don't have to do it anymore and just trust that the settings are mostly correct. So to, to sum some of this up, because I love the story. I mean, you, you were a product originally of the way things worked in Germany, you, right? And right at the edge of basically chaos with the wall going down. Yes. You chose, you, you were able to, you finished your high school, your father helped you start to appreciate and get an understanding of the computers. You decided to go into the, 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 the trade route that you finished early because, again, you had this opportunity to get a job early, which right. you took. It really sounds like as you were moving through this path that where you're at now, I almost feel like you never really thought computers was going to be where you're at, but it was always there. And that, yes. was kept, yeah. that kept coming into your path and you kept kind of grabbing it. Do you, do you still right. play music today? Unfortunately, not these days um, because of kids and like sports. Like now, these days I'm more into sports because you know, I'm getting older, so <laughs> I need to stay in shape. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I, I find it interesting that you were really, I, I think you took real good advantage of the opportunities that were kind of presented to you. And, and you're very stable, like you're there yeah. Dell for seven years, you're going to be here at least seven years. Right now, there doesn't seem to be a reason for you to leave no. with the way VMware is working with tech. Yeah. Exactly. Like, I mean, I own, own VMware so much because of the chances and like opportunities that I had. Right now, there's actually no reason for me to move. In fact, I hope that the stuff we're building here at Office of the CTO turns into like fancy products tomorrow. And there's a lot of opportunity today in VMware, right? I mean, yeah. you're, you're, you're always looking for people worldwide. Exactly, yeah. We're, we are growing actually a lot, and especially in the, the Kubernetes and like platform platform space there. So if you know someone, Bill, drop me a note. <laughs> so does your dad ever take credit for where you are? Like, son, I, you know, I started you off with the computers back in the day. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, he's very humble. He's very humble. Your dad's still an engineer, or he's retired now, or is he still working? He's still, but hopefully by next year he will be retired. Um, just so to enjoy a little bit more of life. He worked hard, like many, many years, and I just hope he will have a couple more years 
to spend with the kids. All right. Well, I, I, I really appreciate you taking the, the time Likewise, over the last cool. hour to kind of tell your story. I, I love the story. It's a, for us who live in the U.S., it's um, really different because in the U.S., you graduate high school, you're basically on your, you turn 18, you're basically on your own up to the point your parents want to support you, right? Um, and it's a really kind of different model here. Not mm, better or worse or, or any of that. So exactly. I think if for, for kids who are living in the U.S., it's interesting for sure. Um, but yeah, I, I just love to hear how people kind of start out and then how they get to uh, the decisions that they made. And you made some really interesting and fantastic decisions. And uh, um, I'm so glad I even got to meet you and have this conversation. I really appreciate it. Yeah, likewise, Bill. I, I really like your podcast because it's a little bit different than the traditional podcast. Like, hey, here's tech. Let's talk tech. You talk people. That's great. So if anybody wants to get in touch with you to talk VMware, Kubernetes, the future, engineering conversations, or see or hear any of your talk, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? Uh, exactly. So Twitter. Um, I'm mostly on Twitter, so I scope my whole social activity down to Twitter. And you can find me on Twitter probably by my name, Michael Gush, or by the handle, which is mbano1, like E M B. A-N-O-1. I'm amongst the 353 followers uh, that you have, Bill. So if just look at Bill's followers and then you'll you <laughs> find me, hopefully, because, you know, that's this roulette thing that you do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll, and we'll get this on the show notes. And definitely, Thank as you. you can tell, Michael's fantastic. He loves to share. So yes. if you're wondering about a career in Kubernetes, if you're wondering about what you're doing, reach out to him. He'll, he'll definitely give you the time. Thank you, Bill. All right. Well, thank you. So this is the Arden Labs podcast signing off and hope to see everybody again real soon.